Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from one of our special guests. Are you ready for the Word? Yes. All right, let's get into the Word tonight. I'm working on a new book, and I have a book called Unlocking the Abraham Promise. And um, that book has been out for a number of years. And, you know, I don't, I don't like writing books. <laughs> They're a lot of work. But um, there's been a book in my heart just for the last maybe three years. And it's on Pursuing Maturity. The title of tonight's message is Pursuing Maturity. And I'm going to start with a quote. I grew up in South Africa. <clears throat> and South Africa's, probably my greatest hero in South Africa is Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela, I grew up under apartheid. I left South Africa because my mother's family were American diplomats. And I had a U.S. citizenship through my mother. And there was no way when I had a choice to fight in the military for an apartheid system or exercise my U.S. citizenship and go abroad. I immediately chose to leave South Africa behind and I refused to fight for that system. And it was an enormous, emotional, amazing thing that happened when Nelson Mandela came from the prison and went to the palace. When he came out of 27 years in Robben Island and in a, in a jail, and he came from that place and became the president of South Africa. And Nelson Mandela changed everything in South Africa to where it is an amazing country. And he brought reconciliation with no guns being fired, no other, you know, all the bloodshed that's happening in the Middle East that we see and other parts of the world. Nelson Mandela was able to accomplish that, you know, because of the strength of his character and because of what God had put him through in his years in prison. And so I start with a quote from a guy called Richard Stengel, who was the managing editor of Time magazine, spent a year with Mandela and did a, a book that was called, um, the name of the book is life, Lessons on Life, Love and Courage. And Richard Stengel um, basically gives a summary statement, and I'm just going to read it to you. He says, the key to understanding Mandela is those 27 years in prison. The man who walked onto Robben Island in 1964 was emotional, headstrong, easily stung. The man who emerged was balanced and disciplined. I often asked him how the man who emerged from prison differed from the willful young man who had entered it. He hated this question. Finally, in exasperation one day, he said, I came out mature. And that word, when I had read this a number of years ago, it just, it just stuck in my heart. He said, I came out mature. And as I've traveled all over the world, we work in all these countries, I have felt a tremendous need for us as the church and for us as individual believers to pursue maturity. And sometimes we think, well, I just, you know, I've accepted Jesus and that's all I need and I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. But the Bible says there's so much more to this life than that. And what I want to challenge you tonight is to pursue maturity. That this needs to be a lifelong goal. It needs to become a lifelong passion. That we come to a place where maturity is in our lives. Now, it's an interesting thing about Mandela is that he was taught by missionaries. I was actually back about a year ago in South Africa, and I went to a new museum that's been built. It's an apartheid museum. It's built at the place where he was captured, when they finally captured him, and he went to Robben Island. And I went through this museum, because I've always had him as a hero, and I've always been fascinated with his life. And this is in a secular museum about his history of his life. I read these words. In fact, I took a photograph of it. And this is what it said about Mandela. It says, missionary teachers contributed to the building of Mandela's character. They set high standards of morality. An important aspect of Christianity was forgiveness. To harbor grievances would be to lessen one, one's own character. That statement was there that 
that missionaries were the ones who actually laid the character foundations in Mandela's life. And they taught him a, a, a profound principle of forgiveness. And, you know, they never knew when they were sowing into that young, young man, like we were sowing into young kids in Bulembu, which is this orphanage town. They didn't know that they were sowing into the future of a nation, that they were actually sowing into the forgiveness where South Africa could easily have gone the way of Rwanda and Burundi, where there would have been a genocide and a civil war. And the country hung in the balance on that in 1994. And instead they sowed into the heart of a person the principle of forgiveness. So that when he took power, he offered the olive leaf and he forgave. And he told everybody else in the nation to forgive. And that is an incredible principle that, that came out of the seed of others that sowed into him. The other interesting thing about Mandela is that he comes from the tribe called the Khorza people. And the Khorza people um, are in a, the western part of, of southern Africa, actually the eastern part of southern Africa, a place called the Transkei. And I have studied the history of South Africa in terms of um, a man by the name of James Missioner. Many of you know his books. He wrote a book called The Covenant. And he tells in The Covenant that the Khorza the tribe, it's got a click in it, it's kind of difficult to pronounce. The Khorza tribe were literally came close to extinction. They were nearly destroyed and it happened in 1857. And what happened was that a young girl in the Khorza tribe, 14 years of age, had this mystical experience where she saw, you know, supposedly a vision. And that in this vision that the Russians were going to come and they were going to rescue them. They were going to come to the beach. Now back in 1857, I mean, they didn't even know where, how that would even be possible. But this 14-year-old girl gave this, this sort of vision to the leaders of this tribe. And the people did not have enough discernment to know whether it was right or wrong. So the nation adopted this vision. But the condition of the Russians coming was that they had to kill all their cattle and they had to destroy all their crops. So they did this. It took six months. They killed 200,000 cattle. They wiped out all their crops. And on the 18th of February of 1857, they all gathered on a beach. And while they gathered there waiting on that day was when they were supposed to be redeemed. And came midday, there was nothing on the horizon. By six o'clock in the evening, panic began to, to set in. And as the sun went down, they looked at each other and they had all been deceived, an entire nation. 80,000 people died and almost an entire tribe. And this was the tribe out of which Mandela came. I think the enemy tried to destroy it before he was born. And so, there's a tremendous lesson in the fact that they didn't have enough knowledge and discernment to be able to know what was truth and what was error. Peter Marshall, who was chaplain of the U.S. Senate, said, if we don't stand for something, we'll fall for anything. So my, my foundational scripture, we're going to put it up, is Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. This is a remarkable comment by the Apostle Paul. Now, remember, this is the greatest saint of the New Testament. The guy who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, Paul. This is not an ordinary believer who just got saved. This is a guy who's really done an enormous amount for God, has touched his generation like no other person, and has touched all generations because he penned two-thirds of the New Testament. But the Apostle Paul writes and says, Not that I've already attained or am already perfected. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid a hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 15, 
Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. Now think of this guy. He's one of the greatest saints that ever lived. And he's coming, you know, on in his walk with God. And he says, hey, I haven't got there yet. He says, the one thing I do, I forget the past. And he says, I'm pressing towards a mark. He said, I want to take a hold of the reason Christ took a hold of me. Every one of our lives, there's a reason God took a hold of your life. Those who've given your life to Christ. There's a purpose. There's a destiny. There's something that God has in this life for you to accomplish and you to do. And you have to actually intentionally reach for it. You've got to intentionally pursue it. You've got to go after it. It's not going to fall into your lap and it's not going to happen just because you are alive. Paul says, I press towards a mark. I'm going after something. And that place, he says, as many people as are mature should be doing the same thing. Amen? Amen. I want to just point out two words for you there. In verse 14, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He talks about a goal and a prize. You see, you can get to heaven and just make it in and survive. Okay, you're in heaven. You're in heaven for eternity. But the Bible says that you can have a prize when you get there. You can have a reward when you get there. You can actually have something which is there and that you'll get to enjoy for all eternity. And that prize is something beyond just existing and just being a Christian and going to heaven. Are you with me, church? It's that place of maturity that God promises to bring so much into our lives. I'm going to give you a few of the benefits of maturity. When you have a maturity in your walk with God, people who have maturity, they experience personal victories over all the Goliaths that come their way. They overcome and they, they get a victory over every obstacle that their life faces. You're guaranteed to have obstacles. You're guaranteed to have trials. You're guaranteed to have trouble. You're guaranteed to have tribulation. Whatever, we're all guaranteed. It's a question of whether your faith overcomes what you face. Whether you are going to have victory in what you do. And people who are mature have live in a place of victory. Number two, the efforts of your life will come to full fruition and multiplication. You see, when Mandela became mature, he was able to impact a nation. He wasn't able to do that when he started, when he went to prison, but when he came out, and he came out to a place of maturity, he suddenly now became the president of a nation, and now an entire nation was led into a place of peace and of reconciliation through the character of somebody who had come to maturity. You know, Jesus talks about the parable of the sower. And when it comes to full maturity is when you get a hundredfold multiplication, a 10,000% increase of the seed. So maturity brings about fruitfulness and multiplication and massive increase. And at the place of maturity, everything that your life is about will come to fruition. Number three, you'll come to a place of stability in your walk with God. I like the way that Richard Stengel says that he was, he was balanced and, and stable and disciplined. And there's something about our lives are not supposed to be like yo-yos. We're not supposed to go up and down. We're not supposed to have emotions going all the way and all around the, you know, uh, just, you know, going up and down all the time. We're supposed to come to a place in our lives where we walk with a stability, where we walk with a confidence, we walk with a, with a knowledge and a, and, a, and a balance and a stability that overrides all of our circumstances. Otherwise, every day is a, is a roller coaster. And people who are mature come to a place of stability and balance. We develop, number four, a true intimacy with God. We'll talk about that in a moment. And number five, your gifts and your callings are fully activated and 
you're able to accomplish a full eternal reward. And we're not talking about your salvation. We're talking about a reward. We're talking about the prize. All right? You can say, well, I don't really care. As long as I make heaven, I'm fine. Let me tell you, a billion, billion years from now, you will care about the person, you know, that guy's been enjoying that for a billion, billion years, and you didn't. And literally what you do in a handful of years here will bring you a reward forever and ever. Amen? So we should care about that eternal reward. So there's four major areas of maturity that I'm going to challenge you with tonight. First one is a maturity in the knowledge of God's Word. This is, and I'm going to give a plug for the Bible school. Our ministry hands up and we have created the world's largest video Bible school. We have 17,000 Bible schools around the world. And 330,000 students in 145 nations. If you don't believe this is a passion of my heart, you know what? That's fruit, that fruit speaks for itself. The passion of my heart is that every one of us will mature in our knowledge of the Word of God. We have to mature in what God says about this life. And the Bible says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Amen? Amen. And so for us, as we go into the new school year, which is um, the registration, I believe, ends in, in uh, like the 8th of, of August, we need to be focusing and pursuing a greater knowledge of God's Word. And I'm not talking about just reading it once a day or whatever. I'm talking about going in and understanding the way God speaks about this world, about our lives, where we are, and what we do. And it is no shortcut to it. Amen? The Apostle Paul writes in Hebrews chapter 6, he says, let's stop going over the basic teachings of our Christ again and again. All right, sometimes, you know, we just hear the same thing and it seems like, well, I know about Jesus saves, I know about this. There is so much more in this book. There is such a mind to be mined. There is so much truth and so much treasure. And so often we just think, well, just imbibe it. But let me tell you, you can pursue it. And you can go after it. And it will change your life. Paul says, let's stop going over the basic teachings. He says, let's go, uh, let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely, we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds, placing our faith in God. You don't need further instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. And so, God willing, we'll move forward to further understanding. So, Paul is saying, hey, let's, let's stop just dabbling in the, in the shallow waters. Let's go deep. Let's learn what this book says. Let's go into a place where we become mature in our understanding of how God sees this world and the treasures and the promises that we can apprehend as Christians. Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul's writing and he's talking about how we come to this maturity and he's speaking about what we call the fivefold ministry. It's the diversity of teachers. It's, it's the different... You know, nobody's got all the answers. And the reason we created the International School of Ministry in our Bible school, we drew on the greatest teachers in the world we could find. We've got Joyce Meyer in there. We've got Jack Hayford. We've got Reinhard Bonke, who's going to be here in October. And we, 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 we drew on the best teachers in the world, not because they were the best teachers in the world, but, you know, in order to make us mature, we need a balance of different anointings and giftings coming and speaking into us. It's not just going to come through one single person. And so the Apostle Paul writes this about the diversity of different people speaking into our lives in Ephesians 4. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we'll be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So he's saying it takes different teachers. It takes a diversity of teachers. And then one teacher will bring you this and one teacher will bring you that. We've got an amazing mix of different teachers in the Bible school. That each will bring some part of it. And you may say, well, I just like the goosebumps. Well, the goosebumps are good. But they're not everything. And we have to have a diversity of different teachings. A teaching anointing is very different from an evangelism anointing. You've got to have the diversity. 
And what does it do as those different giftings teach you? It makes you mature. It develops the gift of God's Word in your life. And then verse 14, he goes on in the next verse and says, Then we will be no longer immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We'll not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we'll be speaking the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. Isn't that powerful? We'll be stable. We won't be tossed to and fro. We won't be back and forth. We won't be like a yo-yo. We won't be like a roller coaster. We'll be in a place where we're, not, we're, we're stable. We're not, you know, going through gymnastics in the way that we understand God's Word. So that's the first area. I'm not going to go much deeper than that. But just to challenge you, grow in the Word of God. It's a pursuit, like the pursuit of happiness. It's a pursuit of maturity. And the first area must be in God's Word because that's where it starts. But the second area to me is a very important one. It's mature in relationships and in kingdom thinking. And we are very blessed at this church because Pastor Jim, Pastor Luke, Pastor Dad, I mean, all of the pastors in this church, they get down on their knees and every Sunday we hear a prayer. And that prayer, you know, I'd never heard in another church. It is a prayer that prays for the, you know, all the churches in the area. Like we're praying for, you know, the Baptists and, the, and, and all the denominations. We're praying for all the groups. And I'm thinking, what's that pastor doing praying for them? We're supposed to pray for us. But you know what? It brings a mentality of kingdom. We're part of one kingdom. We're part of one baptism, one Lord, one Savior, one Bible, one Word of God. Amen? The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and he says... I, brethren, I couldn't speak to you as spiritual people, but to, as carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now, you're still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? One says, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. Are you not carnal? Paul's actually rebuking the church. And you know what? There's no room in the church. There's no room in the church for ageism. No room for racism. There's no room in the church for classism. There's no room for any kind of ism or schism. All right? Amen? Give the Lord a hand. We have to think kingdom. We have this amazing team there in Africa. And I mean, we didn't hardly even know each other before. Many of us, you know, really got to connect with each other. But... I, I didn't even hardly know all the churches that they were from, but, but we just flowed as one team, as one family. And everybody contributed, everyone was a part of it, and it was an amazing way that God worked through different people in different ways. And part of us growing in maturity is really learning to value what every other person brings to the table and what every other person's gift brings to the table. Amen? 2 Corinthians 5, 16 says, Now from now, on, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. That means that the way we see other people is not, oh, you're this, or you're from that country, or you're from this language, or you're from that. God wants us to see that we're part of Christ. We see people and their value in God's kingdom. Now, Lisa, my wife's sitting here in the front row here, and for a number of years, Lisa and I worked uh, for Reinhard Bonkers, an amazing evangelist. Like I say, he'll be here in October. And Reinhard, you know, is, he, he's had up to 1.6 million people in a single meeting. I was his TV producer. I produced and, and these amazing documentaries. I've, I've seen blind eyes open so many, by the, by the thousands probably that I've, seeing God do that miracle. Um, amazing uh, signs and wonders that God did as we worked for Reinhardt. And while we were working with him, we, we, we had an, an incredible experience. Three and a half years, I traveled with Reinhardt by his side, Lisa, most of those years until our daughter was born in Germany. And 
we got to witness documents. I'm this TV producer. I get to interview families and go in and research the miracles and the healings. And it was a phenomenal uh, period of time. But in about 1987, we were in the northern part of Ghana in a city called Tamale. Or Tamale. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce it. And we were in a village. And we were visiting this little village. And Reinhardt was there. And the, all the villages were crowded around. And Lisa's, you know... She, she's, dynamite comes in small packages, let me just say that. She's not tall, all right? And all the kids love her because she's about their size. And so they were like mobbing her. And they still do that. Even when we were in Bulembu, they were all around her. They're all measuring themselves to see if they can be taller than her. And um, anyway, there was a prisoner pit in the ground. And I didn't know that. When the Bible talks about Joseph being thrown into a prisoner pit, there's actually they dig these deep holes because in some of these small villages, they don't have a prison. So they dig a prisoner pit about 10 feet deep, and it's got sheer walls, and you can't get out of it. And Lisa was, was walking along, and everybody suddenly parted, and she went into the prisoner pit. She fell down. And we had to actually have Reinhard... Uh, we had to grab him by his ankles and she, Reinhard put his hands in and he reached in and we pulled Reinhard by his ankles out. He held Lisa's hand and then pulled her out of this prisoner pit. But somehow she damaged the left side of her body. We don't know exactly what happened. But for the next maybe seven to ten years, I don't even know the number of years, but many years, it was over seven years, Lisa had this terrific pain down her left side. Now we're working with one of these amazing evangelists that we've seen blind eyes open, cripples get healed, all these miracles happening, and my wife is still suffering. And she's praying, and we're laying hands, and we're doing everything we knew how. And she suffered with this until like 1995. And I was just, you know, Lord, what's going on? And it was, it was getting worse, and it was more and more serious. We went to the mission field in Nigeria. She still had it when we came back. And when we were back, I get a phone call from a man in Singapore, a small Chinese guy. His name was Brother Leo. And he says, oh, he says, I've read your article in a magazine. And he said, I'm going to fly over. God's given me a vision about, you know, an end time plan that God has. And anyway, he tells me this whole thing. He says, I'm flying over to come and meet you. I'm like, you're flying from Singapore just to come and see me? He says, yes, I'm coming. He says, by the way, I also pray for terminally ill people. So I'm thinking, I'll try and find some terminal people for you to pray for. <laughs> Brother Leon, we, we went around and he came and he, and he, he, you know, he prayed for a number of people. And he was a, in, in the natural sense, he was a very different human being. I mean, very, very diplomatic here. He's a wonderful guy, but definitely had mannerisms and the way that he conducted himself. And it was not the way I would normally would operate. And yet he was a sweet guy, and I saw God using him. And I just, you know, recognized God's using this man despite his mannerisms. So at the end of him time, praying for a lot of people at the church we were attending at the time, he came back, and he came back to my home. And I said, Brother Leon, please come back and visit our home. And he came in the back door. Lisa was about 25 feet away. And as he walked in the back door, I felt the Lord prompt my heart, have him pray for your wife. She's been suffering for all these years with this pain. So I said, Brother Long, I said, please, would, would you pray for Lisa? She's been hurt, suffering with this pain. I said, you know, for a number of years. And I said, please, please. Oh, I would be happy to pray for her. And he took one step towards her. She knelt on the carpet and instantly the power of God hit her and completely healed her. Completely. Now, how many of you sometimes have some questions before God? And I'm asking God, I'm saying, God, we were with one of the greatest evangelists in the world, been around almost every major speaker, from Benny Hinn and all the other big name guys. We've had everybody in the world pray. This little guy shows up from Singapore who's got the weirdest mannerisms and he doesn't even pray for her. He just takes a step towards her and she gets instantly healed. So I'm trying to ask God some questions here. How many of you have a few questions when you get to heaven? Amen? 
And so I begin to really come before God. About a month later, I was ministering in Belgium. I was ministering to some Russian leaders. This is just after the wall came down. And these Russian leaders are in Belgium. And at the end of the time of ministry, they say to me, we would like to pray for you before we leave. I said, well, I'll take prayer anytime. And as I'm being prayed for, I felt a different anointing come upon me than I'd ever felt in my life before. And I'm, I'm querying, I'm saying, God, you know, I've been prayed for by a lot of people, but something's different. Something is unusual. And as I'm being prayed for by these Russian leaders, the Holy Spirit begins to speak to me about the healing of Lisa. The Lord says, I've put different anointings in different nations. I put anointings in different people. And only as you reach out to those people and as, as you receive those people, as you love those people, can you partake of what I have put in their lives for you. We're a global body. The Lord shows me, He says, I gave the healing of your wife to a man in Singapore. Only as you receive that man, despite his mannerisms, and you partook of what I had in that man's life, your wife was healed. Are you with me, church? How much more within our ranks here as a church has God put giftings? Has He put anointings? Has He put things in each person's life? You don't know that the person sitting next to you has maybe got the gift of the healing that you're seeking. You don't know what God has placed in, in, in this church in the diversity of giftings and anointings and nationalities and backgrounds God has placed something in those people's lives for you. And as you become mature in your relationships, you no longer see people after the flesh. You begin to see into the Spirit. You begin to see that this body is global. This body has got diversity. This body is the body of Christ. Amen? We need to become mature in how we see each other. And then we need to become mature in the development of the gifts and the fruit of God in our lives. We just saw the World Cup. And it was, you know, what's remarkable to me when you see an amazing event like that is, you know, it's not so much to me as to what team wins or, or all of those things. And those things are wonderful to follow. But what actually fascinates me is to watch people who have brought their talent to a place of maturity where they can play in front of a billion people and perform to excellence and be able to carry that talent and that gifting to a place where they can, you know, do something significant. That's a remarkable thing to me because it takes an enormous amount of practice and an enormous amount of use to be able to bring a gift or a talent to maturity. We were in this lion arena. There was a man there that ministered in the prophetic anointing. Now, sometimes the prophetic anointing can get really weird. And I'm not talking about good weird. I'm talking bad weird. And that's the reason why many churches are very cautious with the prophetic anointing. But you know, there are times that I have experienced in my life where I've come across a genuine prophetic anointing and a genuine prophetic gift where a person has really taken time with God to come to a place where they can operate in a depth of maturity so that they can speak into other people's lives in a way that edifies and encourages and speaks into the heart. And literally God can put His finger on issues in your life that you have no other way of knowing and that no other person knows except God and you. And we had a person minister to our team just who spoke in that type of maturity. And to me, it was an enormous blessing to see that. When I was with Reinhardt, I was, you know, very, very concerned. When I started, we just got married, and I was concerned about going into some of these countries because Reinhardt's a target. You know, we had tear gas bombs thrown at us. I mean, they've tried to assassinate him. They have done many different groups that have tried to take him out of the picture. And I'm thinking, Lord, I'm now traveling with this guy. You know, I can also be sort of a side casualty here. And I was very, very cautious about going into these very, you know, uh, 
difficult parts where there's coups and all kinds of things. And I remember on about the second crusade that I had with Rhino was actually Malawi. And I remember being in a worship meeting and the whole team was gathered. And I was just coming before God and I just remember the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart, saying, you can trust my leadership through Reinhard Bonker. That's what God spoke to me. That there's a maturity in his man's walk with God and a maturity in his leadership capacity that I could trust his leadership ability. Let me tell you, that's the reason why our ministry and our church is under the rock. Because I can trust the maturity of the leadership. I can see that in this church, there is maturity from the top to the bottom. There is health in the children's ministry, in the youth ministry, in the outreach ministry. There's health in the feeding, in the feeding programs, in the word that's preached from this pulpit. There's maturity. Maturity is a very valuable asset. And when a person's gift comes to a place of maturity, now where does that leave you and I? That means that we have to develop our, our gift. It says here in Hebrews chapter 5, this is the New Living Translation. Solid food, everybody say solid food. Solid food. Or I remember you drink milk until you become mature and then you eat solid food. Are you with me? All right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training, everybody say training, training. have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Now the New King James says it this way, solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. All right. What is it? By reason of use or by training. That means that the guys in the World Cup is because they've trained to get there. That means we, if we're going to come to maturity, have to train. We have to use and discern and we've got to develop the talents, the gifts that God's given us to a place they can become mature. Because only at the place of maturity, when you step out in a gift and it's not mature, you can do casualty damage. You can bring casualties and do damage. Your gift has got to become mature, balanced, disciplined, in a place that it can be used. At that place, it will be a blessing to others and it will be able to be impactful for God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. One last thing in this area. You know, I was a children's pastor for a number of years at Cottonwood. And Lisa was for about four years. I was for two years. And... There was a young man there whose name was Chris. His father, Joe Pavlik, this was his name. He had, a, he had damaged his kneecap. He had an accident on the job where the actual kneecap was ripped off the, off the bone. It was ripped off, his, off the joint. So the whole kneecap was ripped off. And from that point, I mean, this guy lived in pain day and night. Now I was ministering to his, his son in children's church. And we were recording different speakers from around the world. And we recorded two sessions with a person called, uh, many of you may know, the, the Hunters. Charles and Francis Hunter. They had a remarkable healing ministry. I don't know how much they're active right now, but a mature healing ministry. They're known worldwide. So we were recording them on a different subject, but I knew they were coming to our studios, and I knew they were coming to our office. And I, I said to this kid, I said, look, they're coming between 2 and 3. They're going to be leaving to the airport. I said, bring your father and let's have them pray for him. Now, we're talking about a kneecap that's been, you know, severed and ripped off the knee. Off the knee. So this guy lived, had a brace on 24-7. And when he came to church, he always sat there and he put a chair up next to him and he had to put his, his foot up on a chair. And he lived in agony. He came to our offices at that, same at that right time. And I never forget what happened. This... Charles Hunter was probably in, in his late 80s. This man has walked with God and seen miracles all over the world. And I said to him, I said, look, well, this one of the parents of one of our kids in children's church. I said, he's just got a problem with his knee. Could you pray for him? And so he had his jeans on. He had the, he had the brace on underneath it. So he said, okay, bring up a chair. And I remember he put up his chair, put up his leg on the chair like this. And Charles Hunter took a hold of the top of that kneecap. And he began to speak into that knee. 
He began to command a new kneecap. He began to command new tissues to be formed. He began to command a, a creative miracle that God would create a new kneecap and that he would rejoin all the parts of there. And he's just commanding and speaking. And then he said, Amen. And he left, went to the airport. Joe Pavlik went home, took off the brace, was completely healed from that day to this day, entirely new kneecap. It was amazing. And I realized a mature gift in healing. Here's a guy that knew what he was doing. It wasn't just sort of a hit and miss, oh God, you know, something. I mean, he knew what he was doing. He knew how to do it. And that miracle happened in front of my eyes. I mean, it was still to this day a remarkable miracle. His, his gift had come to a place of maturity. When your gift comes to maturity, you're going to have fruit. Amen? Amen. Can you take one more point? Amen. This last one is that we'll become mature in our intimacy with Christ. We'll become an overcomer. Now, I may shake some of your theology right now. Not every Christian is an overcomer. Not every Christian will go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. All the promises in the book of Revelation are to the overcomers. They are to people who overcome in their walk with God. And just because you're saved, you're saved, you'll make heaven. You'll have eternity with God. But the overcomers get an eternal reward the overcomers are the ones that rule and reign with Christ. The overcomers are the ones that go to the marriage supper of the Lamb that become the bride. That become the bride in a, in a, in a dimension, in a way that I don't fully fathom. Now there's a parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 25. It says, The kingdom of heaven should be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now we're not talking about five virgins and five harlots. We're talking how many virgins? Ten. They're all saved. All right? They're all going to heaven. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. Those who took were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. The wise took oil in their vessels, in their lamps. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom's coming. Go out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No. Lest there should not be enough for us and you. But you go rather unto those who sell and buy it for yourselves. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him in the, to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly I say to you, I do not know you. Now, the word know in Scripture speaks about intimacy. The word know means that we come to a place where we really don't just know about God, we know Him. And this is a call and a, 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 a clarion word from the Lord to, to challenge all of us to pursue intimacy with God. We're talking about knowing Him, not just knowing about Him. And that is a lifelong pursuit and that's why Paul, you know, has that at the end of his life. He's saying, I haven't got there yet. But I have one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to pursue this. All right? Now, the intimacy and the overcomers are very much revealed in the book of Revelation. And we're just going to look at them on the screen one by one just very quickly. These are the promises to Jesus says, to those who overcome, I'm going to give this. Now, this is conditional. This is not just everybody. He doesn't say, if you accepted Jesus and invited me to life, you're going to get this. He says, no, to those who overcome. Means that there's a degree of maturity that these people have come where they have persevered and they've overcome every obstacle through their faith in God. This is the promises and to the Ephesus church. To him who overcomes, I'll give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To the Smyrna church, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. To Pergamos, to him who overcomes, I'll give some of the hidden manna to eat. 
And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written that no one knows except those who receive it, or him who receives it, Thyatira. And he who overcomes and keeps my works till the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. I will give him the morning star. In Revelation 3, the Sardis church, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. I will not blot out his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. To the Philadelphia church, he who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God. I will write on him my new name. To the Laodicean church, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Isn't that amazing? Those are promises that God gives to the people who become mature. People who overcome, come to a place where their faith has grown, to a place where they really do something with it. Jesus said that they overcome is the way that I overcame. Do you notice that Jesus just didn't get born and then just, you know, go to be with the Father? He had to do something. He had to fulfill the purposes of God for his life. He had to pursue the calling. And so we go back to our original scripture, Philippians chapter 3. Where Paul writes again, not that I've already attained I'm, or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, as, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. Are you with me, church? Amen. God's calling us to maturity. He's calling us to have a passion to pursue a place in Him, a place of victory, a place where we come to where we develop our gifts and callings, a place where we understand His Word, where we pursue a depth of understanding, a place where our relationships, where we discern His body, and we come to a place, you know, where our gifts and talents get developed to be used. And a place where we find intimacy with God. So we know Him and can partake in everything that He has for our future. If the Lord spoke to you tonight, give the Lord a hand. Amen. 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 It would be a shame if we left tonight and we didn't give everybody a chance. If you've never accepted Christ, the place to start a maturity is to get born again by his kingdom. Jesus actually made the statement, he says, unless a person's born again, you'll never understand the kingdom of God. You'll never come into the kingdom of God. And being born again is really an amazing uh, thing that happens. Uh, I was going to a church for, you know, 12 years of my life, until I was 12 years old, I should say, sometimes up to six times a week. And nobody ever told me that I could actually have a relationship with God, that that I could come into a place where God would transform me on the inside and my spirit would be reborn and I would have a relationship opened up where my spirit would communicate with God's spirit and that I could live in that and have a new place and a new destiny as I accepted Christ into my life. I, you know, heard about it, but I never knew how to do it. And so only when I was 12 and I was at a boarding school in Africa that a man came in, I don't even know his name to this day. And I was probably the only kid out of 400 kids in the school that accepted Christ that night. But I walked out into the night and I said, something's happened on the inside of me. And a friend of mine, one of the only other Christians in the school said, you just got born again. And it was a simple thing where I realized that I wasn't, even though I had been going to church my whole life, I wasn't going to heaven. That I had to personally invite Jesus into my life. I had to personally accept what he did on the cross for me. And I had to personally come into a relationship and invite him to be the Lord and Savior of my life. And I want to give every person that here is here a chance tonight to do that. All our eyes are closed for a moment. I'd just like to give you a chance. If you need to accept Jesus tonight as your Lord and Savior, and maybe God's been knocking on your door for a long time. Maybe friends have been saying, you need to get saved. You need to give your life to God. I want to give you a chance tonight to be able to accept him. So if you would like me to pray for you and with you tonight, if you want to give Jesus your heart, you want to come into his kingdom, 
and you want to make Him Lord and Savior of your life, wherever you are, I just want you to raise up your hand. Wherever we are, just raise up your hand. If you need to pray and you need to ask Jesus into your life tonight, just raise up your hand and you need prayer. Just raise up your hand wherever you are. If you need to accept Christ as Savior, raise up your hand. Anybody that needs to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ tonight, is there anybody that needs to make that decision? You don't often have chances. I see your hand. Anybody else that needs to do that? God bless you. Anybody else that needs to make Jesus Lord and Savior of your life tonight? I'm going to tell you a true story that in Africa we had a, an altar call like this. A young man came forward. He was 28 years old. He accepted Christ into his life. He turned around and walked about 9 or 10 paces and dropped down dead. You don't always have, you think you have a, oh, I can do that a lot. You don't know the letters that have come into this church of people that didn't accept Christ and then went out and literally destroyed their lives and wrote to us from prison. The Bible says today is the day that you need to make the decision. Don't put it off to another day. God's presence is here. He's calling you. Is there anybody else that needs prayer tonight that you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Anybody else? Just raise up your hand wherever you are. In the mother's rooms, anybody else? Another one over here? Just raise up your hand and wave it at me. I see your hand. I see over there. Anybody else that needs to do that? I see your hand. Anybody else that needs to do it? I see your hand at the back there. Anybody else that needs to do it? I see your hand over here. Anybody else? Do not put this off. Anybody else that needs to accept Christ? Let's all stand in the presence of God. All right? And if you need prayer, I'd like the privilege of praying for these people up front. If you could just step out of the, in, out, into the aisle, just come and meet me out in front. And other people, just give them a hand as they come. Just, and if you do raise your hand, come as well. Just come down. I'd like the privilege of praying for you. Just step out and come down. God bless you, man. God bless you over there. Come and join us up front. God bless you. needs to make this decision tonight. God bless you. God bless you, man. Anybody else? Make Jesus Lord tonight. Do not put it off till tomorrow. Make him Lord tonight. Have enough courage. He walks Calvary for you. And you can walk an aisle for him. God bless you. Anybody else that needs to do that? Come forward. God bless you. Thank you. Best decision you guys ever made. I'm going to lead you guys in a prayer. And I'm going to turn you over to Joey here in a moment. Just, I want you to pray this to Jesus. And all the congregation is going to join us as well. Just pray this from your heart. You're not praying it to a man. You're praying it to Jesus. Say, dear Jesus, I thank you that you love me. That you died on a cross for my sins, for my salvation. I believe that you're the Son of God, that you rose from the dead, that you're alive right now, and you're listening to this prayer. I ask you, Jesus, forgive my past, wash my sins clean, and I ask you now, tonight, come into my heart, be my Lord, be my Savior. I give my future to your hands and I thank you that I am now saved I am a child of God heading for heaven and denying hell thank you Jesus for saving my soul in Jesus name Amen give the Lord a hand Amen God bless you guys best decision ever made I'm turning to Pastor Joey over here He's going to give, just do a few things with you, give you some free literature. If you can just follow him, just God bless you. Give them a kind as they go. Give us a moment. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer, 
of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.